Hello, everybody. Hi, how are you, Hello. sir? Good, thanks. Hi, David, Tyrone, Steph, Carlo, Andros, how are you all doing? I should have, should have put a jacket on for you, David, today. I forgot. I, I know, sorry. I'm, I'm slightly overdressed, sorry. No, you're looking pretty <laughs> Tyrone's kind of looked like he's just come off the, the training pitch, so that's good. <laughs> I'd love to hear from you guys today a little bit about your reflections, your experiences, um, what you think has been really good, what you think has not been great. So maybe, David, if you're okay, if I start with you, um, just to hear a little bit about your experiences, and, and particularly, David, to ask you, What's different about mental health and how it's seen nowadays compared to maybe when you were playing? And, and do you feel you as a, as a former player can speak more openly now you've left the game than it was before? How, how do you think the culture shifted? Well, firstly, congratulations. And also, um, thank you for inviting me to be part of this, obviously, this campaign and the conversation about mental health and mental fitness. Um, you know, when, when we talk about, you know, when I was playing, you know, it makes me feel pretty old. So uh of course things were a lot different you know uh when i first started my career um i think that obviously when i was playing you know stakes were higher but i don't think they're as high as they are now in the game but i feel there's so many more distractions and obstacles now that that can affect players from from a very young age and that's why i think that what you've done and what you've created and what you know um what is happening here with this movement is so important you know it's it's okay to not be okay and i think back in the day it wasn't it wasn't okay to you know have a problem and and david do you think um if you'd said something back then say i mean i imagine for you particularly being captain of england and some of the instances that you had to deal with particularly i'm thinking the argentina game those sorts of pressurized situations where uh, effectively everyone you know suddenly had an opinion on on your career and your footballing and everything else like that did that did that, did you ever feel you needed to speak to someone in the club or someone at national level and and did you feel the support was there if you needed to i was very lucky you know i was very lucky that i was at a club like manchester united with a manager like sir alex ferguson with the players that i'd grown up with from age 14 years old the fans that i had uh, at united and also you know, parents and and my family and obviously the friends that I had around me. But still, I think that obviously, you know, 98 was a very difficult time for me. Um, you know, when I look back on it now, I didn't realise how hard it was. But I, I just remember, you know, the times where I faced the adversity throughout my career, um, you know, 98 was by far the toughest. You know, for example, you know, obviously when I, when I did get sent off, the first phone call was from Sir Alex Ferguson. The first phone call was from him saying, come back to the club, don't worry, we will look after you. And as soon as I got back to the club, you know, Manchester United, Sir Alex Ferguson, the fans, there was, there was a ring put around me where, you know, I, I didn't speak to the media. The manager protected me. Once you're on the field, you have to mentally prepare for that. You have to really understand that, yes, you have your teammates, but that doesn't make you stop thinking, what are they saying about me out, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the crowds? And I think that I went through that, you know, uh, at a very young age. You know, I, I made a mistake. You know, I made a mistake in 98. And um, I think the reaction at the time was pretty brutal. Um, I was constantly criticised on the pitch verbally. But like I said at the start of this, you know, times have changed. You know, if social media was around when I was going through, you know, that, that time in 98, it would have been a whole different story. Um, but I was lucky. I had a support system within Manchester United and the manager and obviously family. But did I feel at the time it was OK to go to someone and say, um, I need help? Um, no. No, because like I said, it was a different era uh, and I just felt that I had to keep it all in and, uh, and deal with it myself. Whereas now I'm the one that's preaching to my, to my kids and also to other kids that I talk to out there that it's really important to talk. It's really important to say if you're not okay, because like you've said that this time, more than any time, you know, there'll be a lot of sportsmen, there'll be a lot of footballers that have had four or five months off that are coming back into the game that 
have, have been anxious over this time because I think everyone has. Everyone's gone through a difficult time. Um, but we all know now that it's okay to not be okay. And it's okay to say that. It's okay to come out and say, I need help. And David, you touched on a bit there, obviously, with being a dad, but as you're an owner of a foot, football club now, um, what, what sort of things will you be setting to make sure that, you know, your clubs and your, your players are well looked after and, and have the support if they need it? Without a doubt. You know, obviously, my, my role is, has slightly changed from obviously being uh, a footballer now to, to an owner. And it's one thing, you know, being obviously now an owner of a football team, you know, the most the most important thing to us is that our players feel protected, um, that the pressures that your modern day athletes have uh, and footballers have um, are taken care of. That's the most important thing. Of course, we want to be successful, but more importantly than, than any, we want our players to be looked after. Absolutely. No, quite, quite, quite well said, David. Um, and maybe Tyrone turning to you next, if that's okay. Just to ask you your thoughts and your experiences, Tyrone, of obviously um, playing at the heart of Villa, but also playing for England now as well. How how has that pressure affected you, and whether you, you 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 relish that pressure? I'm sure you do. But how does it? How do you manage it? How do you look after your mental well-being? And also, maybe you could touch on a little bit with your experience of injuries, because obviously you had a, quite a few setbacks um, at Bournemouth you know, with your injuries. How did that affect your your sort of positivity and your ability to to keep wanting to, to do the job? In terms of my playing career, it's, it's gone in many different directions and it probably came slightly earlier than what I thought in the season. I mean, the first international camp and, and squad that was released, I was included in. And yeah, it came with a whole new set of pressures, a whole new set of challenges. And one of them was probably how to deal with coming back from England to being a club player again. Um, I'd just been called up for the first time. All of a sudden, people were expecting me to probably be a lot better and a lot more experienced than I actually was. Um, and I found that it actually affected my performance, not because not because I think naturally people thought, ah, oh, he thinks that he's made it and he thinks that he's better than he is now. I think if anything, it was the complete opposite. I came back and I found myself playing within myself because I didn't want to make mistakes. I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to put any unnecessary pressure on myself. And they're things that are, that are nothing to do with football. They are just a mentality. And I mean, I, I spoke with a psychologist ever since I got injured at Bournemouth. And that was 2015. Um, and we've spoke weekly ever since. And I think that that's something that has really helped me. So I found that when it comes to football and, and using a psychologist, it just seemed like a, a natural step. And my injury... At Bournemouth, obviously, I, I felt like I'd worked so hard and faced so many setbacks and challenges to get to the Premier League eventually. To then get injured for the rest of the season on my debut was was crushing. And I felt like at that point, I was at my lowest. I didn't know if Bournemouth were going to stay in the league. I didn't know if I'd get a chance to play in the Premier League again. So having the control taken away from myself um, and my fate or my career was no longer really in my hands was probably the most mentally unstable I'd been. And I felt like that was a natural time to speak with a psychologist or life coach or whatever you want to call them and, and just try and get to the bottom of why I was feeling like that or how I could get myself out of it. And uh, I think it is a, a battle you have to, to keep on top of and something that you really have to keep talking about. Um, I just don't, I want to ask you, um, am I right in saying you set up your own academy? Can you just talk a little bit about what academy players might be going through and, and how you support them? Yeah, so I was at Southampton as an as a academy player and got released at 15. So I kind of seen the good and the bad side of academies. Um, they, are, they are amazing they have amazing pools of talent and they, they can be a great pathway into the professional game, but they can also be quite challenging. So I wanted to create an environment that is kind of like additional training, but is um, coach. All the coaches there are very high level coaches. So you still get quality coaching, but I felt like kids are exposed to pressure at such young ages 
um, in academies and kind of like year long contracts. And will I be, will I be kept on for the next year or um, parents putting pressure on them to stay in the academies because they think it's the best place for their development or um, I just, I just felt like it was a really unstable, unstable place for, for kids to be mentally. Um, and I'm not saying that they should come to mind rather than be in football academies, because like I said, I think they are great pathways. But if kids ever want to go be away from that and, and come for some extra training or be in an environment where they don't feel pressurized to like I said win games or impress people, then that's the kind of environment that we, that we, that we set up and we've had really good feedback. And no, super. Well, um, I wish you the best of luck with the Academy. Obviously, I think it'd be fantastic and keep a careful eye on, on how you're going to um, make sure that mental health is at the heart of, of what's going on in the Academy. Um, Thank and- you very much. If I could turn to you, Andros, I really appreciate you being on because you've very um, eloquently spoken before about mental health challenges and, and how you've um, dealt with them. Yeah, uh, first of all, again, thanks for having me on. It's a huge honour. Um, I think if I'll start where uh, Tyrone uh, alluded to is after my England debut, um, I was kind of thrusted into the spotlight back in 2014 um, before the, the World Cup was going to be this next big thing. Um, and at the start, it was great. I loved the, uh, the kind of the media attention, being uh, on the back pages and being in the papers every other day. Um, I felt like I was on the top of my game. But soon after that, I picked up an injury. Um, and I never quite, it took me a while to, to get back to where I was. So now I was not feeling as great as I was. I wasn't playing well. I was in and out of the team. Um, and that's when I really struggled. Um, that's when... The, the great press turned into negative press and I was on the back pages for the wrong reason. I was in the papers, I was in the news for the wrong reason. Uh, what's happened to Andros? He's not playing well. He's out of the team. Um, has he lost his focus? What's happened? Uh, is he going to get called up to England? Should he? Um, and that, that really affected me. Um, and I think I wasted probably a good two, what, two or two, three years trying to get back to the previous Andros. Um, watching old clips of England Spurs coming into this room, looking at that, that picture there and seeing myself scoring and celebrating for England and not understanding why I couldn't do that anymore. Um, and it's at that time when I spoke to a, a psychologist, I spoke to a sports psychologist and we kind of worked through some things. And the, the main thing he said was to, to kind of forget about the past. Uh, what happened in 2014 is gone. Um, try and work on being the best version you can be now. And I think it was only then that I did kind of enter a new mental state where what happened in the past happened in the past. And I was now focused on the, the present and, and what I can do in the future. And it was only then that I did start having a, an upturn in form and getting back to, to the player I know, know I can be. Uh, it's really interesting, Andros, you mentioned about how the, the difference between how you were playing in, in 2014 and then how you try to get back to that level. And you alluded to the fact that mentally, that was there was a big reason you couldn't reach it. And that's quite important. I mean, that, your sort of example there really sums up just how much the power of the mind is and how important mental health is. The biggest eye opener for me was uh, during lockdown. I had the opportunity to watch uh, a lot of my old highlights and a lot of my old clips, and it actually turned out that the, the spell where I felt I wasn't playing anywhere near I was capable of. Now I've had three or four years have passed and I can watch it back. I was actually the same player. Um, I, I moved the same way. I just, in my mind, I wasn't, I didn't believe in myself as much as I did before. And it's a real eye opener how powerful the mind is. It can make you believe all sorts. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And, and Andres, what would you say to other players who might be struggling at the moment within the Premiership, within any walk of football life, who don't necessarily feel they could speak out yet or maybe feel a bit nervous about, you know, oh, if I go and speak to the manager, I might get dropped. What, what would you say to those individuals who might be feeling like that? I think it doesn't have to be the manager. I think it's speaking to anyone, uh, speaking to a teammate, a uh, friend, because your, your teammates have been through it. They're, they're maybe a, a more experienced teammate. They've been through it. They've been through the ups and downs and they've come from the other side. So, um, And maybe Steph, if I can turn to you now. Um, obviously, captain for both the Lionesses and Man City. Um, maybe just a little bit from you about how, uh, how do you think a greater understanding of mental health and football maybe shapes the way that you, you yourself lead your teams or support your teammates? Got the honour of, man, um, of captain in Man City, but also England, which is the greatest honour you can ever have. And 
Um, it, it was an interesting pathway in terms of how I got the captaincy and um, I think in terms of the mental point of view, I think I tried to be someone that um, I wasn't. I tried to be everybody's mate. When I first got given the captaincy, I had a lot more experienced players above me, the likes of Farrell Williams, Casey Stoney, who had every right to, to be captain. But um, I had the honour of having the armband and them first six months, um, it really affected the way that I played because I tried to use all my energy in trying to be everybody's best mate. I tried to um, make sure everybody's okay, whereas actually I was the one that was suffering in the way that my form dipped. I wasn't being the player that I was. And that's when I had to speak to the psychologist. He kind of pulled us aside, like, right, okay, we need to just go back to the basics of how you've actually been given the captaincy and what type of leader do you want to be? And obviously, um, a lot of the captains that I look up to really led by example on the football pitch. Um, so I think it was kind of what Tyrone was alluding to in terms of control and what you can control. And at that moment in time, the only thing that I could control was how I played and how I was around the team and really sticking true to my beliefs of how football should be and how a captain should be. So um, I think as a leader, you try and be um, this person that's always strong and always really positive. But the reality is sometimes you're going to have a bit of a bad day. And I think the way that you grow as a leader and you, the way that the environment is able to, for people to open up is if you show that little bit of vulnerability and maybe one day you do have a little bit of a bad day, you're a bit down or you've maybe not played as well as you possibly can, it's okay to kind of show that. No, absolutely, Steph. And, and you're, you're leading by example in the very way you're talking about sports psychologists and the fact that you're very openly saying, listen, I'm, that's part of my game. It's part of how I get prepared and, and how I'm growing as a player. That is in itself leading by example, by showing others you know, around you that if the captain's going to do it, then it's totally acceptable for everyone else to do it. So I think that can only be commended you're doing that. How do you think, Steph, you know, players, clubs can do more to help um, everyone understand and, and deal with some of the criticism and the, the scrutiny that comes through social media on players? I think it's important that we have that balance. I think um, it's important. I think in football, it's, you have these unbelievable highs, but you have these lows as well. And I think you can kind of get that feeling off short social media as well. If you have an absolutely amazing game, there's so many tweets, Instagrams, whatever it might be, saying well done. But as soon as, say for example, I missed the penalty in the semi-final, I didn't look on my phone for four or five days because I was just like, I know exactly what's coming in terms of the messages. And it wasn't intentional to miss a penalty, but at the same time, people make you feel like that. So I think it's important that we have that kind of awareness and uh, to have that conversation within teams and especially the younger generation coming up to go, right, okay, social media is a great thing for a lot of things to promote campaigns, to obviously build people's profiles, but at the same time, it can be quite hurtful. And I think sometimes you don't realise people do read a tweet or an Instagram and actually it stays with them for a long time. And Carlo, sorry, last but not least to you, um, I'd just love to hear from you, Carlo. I am the old guy. Yeah, exactly, of course. The, the wisest one of us all here, Carlo, that's what you are. Um, what, what's, from a managerial point of view, Carlo, what do you think, um, you know, how do you think the important role that managers play uh, in supporting the well-being of their players, how do you think that materialises and what is your experience of being able to support, um, you know, mental health and, and, and players generally? Thank you for inviting me. It's really, for me, it's really interesting, a really important aspect this because um, the manager ask uh, the demands uh, the task the football asks to the players is really high because you demand to be fit in physical in great physical condition and to be mentally strong you ask to the player to be focused to be motivated to be concentrated all the time in training and in games so the demand that to the players is really, really high. I think that to be a player is a fantastic uh, job. It's a fantastic, it's not a job, it's a passion. But it, 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 it changed from the past and it is, it is changing. And uh, if I know everything about the physical condition, with the statistic, with data, we can know everything. I, I know exactly if player is fit 
80%, 90%, 100%. More difficulty to know about it is mental condition. <clears throat> and also, it is, in my experience, it is really rare that the players come to you and say, mentally, I'm not good. <clears throat> really rare. I, it never happened. It's changing. In the, in the past few years, something has changed. The fact that the players come and say to you, I have a panic attack. Uh, I am. I feel a lot of pressure on my shoulders, but before, never. It never happens that come to me and say, I have mental problem. And I hope that this is going to change because it's really important aspect. What I can do for them, first of all, really important that the, the, the relationship that you are able to build with the players, really important the environment and um, that club has to be able to um, to build the sense that an environment where the place the player feel comfortable feel uh, safe feels that he can speak he can explain his thought without problem and Carlo, I mean, imagine this scenario, which is that, you know, one of your star players comes to you, you know, the day of a, a Premier League match and says to you, I'm not, I'm not right, Carlo. I'm, I'm really struggling today. I've got issues at home or I'm really anxious or I'm, I, I'm having a panic attack. How do you as a manager, you know, deal with that situation? You know, you need him on the pitch. You need him part of the team. People are going to ask questions why he's not there. How, how does if that scenario ever does arise and obviously we in many ways we want that to happen we want players to feel that they can put the hand up and say you know i'm not i'm not okay today i'm i'm i'm, I'm worrying i'm struggling or whatever it might be how do you as a manager deal with that situation if it does appear you have to give to them all the support and the club has to give to them to 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 him all the support i can't thank you all enough for your time it's been really fascinating hearing your talk and obviously hearing it from the horse's mouth as it were um is is, is the best way of being able to sort of formulate a plan and and i really hope you guys um feel that the, the tide is is turning on mental health and we're we are making progress